Thank you for that introduction, Kate, and thank you for that very warm welcome. It's lovely to be able to kick off this fascinating day um, with an opening keynote. And over the course of the next half an hour or so, I'd like to present to you an argument about the nature and construction of the world class performance. As Kate alluded to, I'd like to take fire right at the outset at the pervasive and rather seductive idea of the world today that world class performance is largely or predominantly about natural talent. So you have a certain group of people who are born with the right set of gifts uh, or aptitudes, or in the scientific vernacular, the right kind of gene genetic inheritance that enables them to excel. And on the other hand, you have a group of people who lack those gifts or aptitudes, and by implication are destined at best for mediocrity. I will argue that this notion, which is a cornerstone of Western culture, is at best misleading and at worst highly destructive. Destructive of the people who buy into it, and that's very many of us, and corrosive of the institutions, whether businesses uh, or sports clubs or schools, that construct their culture upon it. I want to argue that the two very important <coughs> above all else that predict high levels of performance in anything complex, and if I've got time I should try and define complexity as I go along, each of which is important, and I'll try and make some observations about both of them, on the quantity of our practice, or the quantity of our domain experience on the one hand, and the quality of our practice, the quality of our domain experience. This second one, I think, is terribly important and very underestimated, both in the psychological literature and in conventional culture. Now, Kate Mother kindly mentioned that before becoming a, an author, journalist, I was a table tennis player, try not to call it ping pong, it's possible. <laughs> um, and, uh, if, if I had brought a high level opponent with me today at a table tennis table, I submit to you that if you had watched us play, you know, world class table tennis players in action, you would have been very struck both by the all round elegance uh, of the coordination, <laughs> but, but more significantly about the speed. If anyone caught table tennis on the telly last summer during the Olympic Games, it's one of the fastest sports in the world. The acoustics of table tennis are rather distinctive. Ka-ching, 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 all crossing the net five or six times a second. And it is perfectly natural when watching two elite table tennis players in action to infer that we were blessed with super fast reactions. How else are we able to get a racket on ball in the blink of an eye? We're almost drawn to that conclusion by the visual dynamic of what you're watching. And when I was playing, you know, a few journalists who came along were, were really taken by the, the sheer speed. And one journalist who watched me play in the US Open wrote in the national paper, this is a snippet that I cut out and kept. Matthew Side has reaction speeds at the outer limits of human capability. <laughs> and that's often the way we conceptualize success. If you were to watch a chess grandmaster playing multiple games of chess simultaneously whilst blindfolded, it would be natural to infer that they were blessed with a super huge memory, more synapses. How else are they able to keep track of this information in real time where we struggle to remember the telephone number of a friend or colleague? <coughs> Or if we watch a mathematical prodigy <coughs> doing multi-digit calculations in their head, we assume they've got a more efficient processor, a, more, a, a stronger level of computation. In other words, we essentialize our analysis of success, conferring upon the expert an innate talent or gift that we lack because we can't do what they do. These inferences, interestingly, are provably false. Moreover, they have direct implications for our behavior, which are destructive. And I'll move on to that in a second. I'd love to debunk all of the assumptions that I've just mentioned, but let me just stick to reaction speed and sport being significant to high-level performance. Something that, as you know, I sort of fall into. I love the idea that I have super-fast reactions, but I was disabused of this notion when I had a game of, uh, of tennis, not table tennis, tennis, with a chap called Michael Stieg. Uh, who's the ball has some of you all know the name, the former Wimbledon champion, the Forest Matter of the final. I was at the Harvard Club in Chelsea interviewing him for my newspaper, The Times. He was there promoting a competition <coughs> to play later that week at the Royal Albert Hall. And my 
editor said, Matthew, it might be a rather nice idea if instead of going along with a dictaphone and doing a conventional interview, take your record along, have a game, and interview him across the net. So I said, right over to him. And ideas that features editors have. You've gone on to become a sports editor at the time, so annoyingly. Um, so there I am, having a sort of game with Steve at the Harvard Club, and it's kind of quite jocular and conversational. And I'm getting slightly bored. I wanted to really feel his power and force and this array of shots that he had on offer. So I said, Michael, um, I'm also um, an internationally acclaimed uh, sportsman. And he, he said, uh, really, I've never heard of you. Uh, and, uh, I'm so slightly irritating. And I said, if you, go, if you go to the other end of the court and serve the ball as fast as you can, I will be able to return the ball. Utterly convinced that the super fast reaction that have propelled me to the top of the glass table there, returning the serve and tennis is going to be relatively straightforward. After all, the gap between two table tennis players is about nine feet, which is the length of a table tennis table. In tennis, the distance between two players is roughly the distance between me and the final row of players in this room. So even though they hit the ball as fast in tennis as in table tennis, you have six times as long in which to react. So, you know, I'm not an idiot, I don't think I'm going to hit a winner, but I think I'm going to get a racket on board and keep it in play. So Stieg started warming up, and the atmosphere in the Harvard Club became ever so slightly tense. <laughs> uh, Jeff, the guy from the Sunday Telegraph, said, Matthew, this might be rather embarrassing. And I said, Jeff, you've obviously never seen me play in the National <laughs> so, uh, the right. so, so I sort of six now down the other end of the court, and I get down coiled like a spring to return serve. And Stick bounced the ball, looked rather archly across the net, threw it up, whirled into his service action, and the ball came over the net, hit the court on my side, hit the wall behind, and I hadn't moved a muscle. <laughs> hadn't, hadn't, hadn't even twitched. And it's characteristic of, and this is a I don't know whether the other sports speakers today will agree. It's characteristic of the sheer arrogance of a lot of top sports people. Well, I remember thinking, hmm, I must have blinked at just the <laughs> <laughs> So I said, do it again. He, he served four straight aces, came from there, and gave me a high five, and so I slowed the last one down. <laughs> so embarrassing, sadly, but also, and this is really the key point, I will submit this is deeply paradoxical. If speed in sport, or speed in business decision making, or speed in rapid fire chess is about the thing that we conventionally think it's about, namely innate reactions, and is by implication at least partially transferable, why am I as a top table tennis player able to react to a smash kill in the blink of an eye? But I don't move at all when returning a serve in tennis with about six times as long. You have almost half a second to react to a serve in tennis. And to find an answer whilst researching uh, Bounce, the book that uh, Kate kindly mentioned, I went to Liverpool John Moores University, and a world leader in perceptual expertise in sport, Professor Mark Williams. And he hooked me up to motion sensors on my feet and lower body, an eye tracking monitor on my eyes, and then he had a big screen of a life-size opponent and he had that opponent serve a tennis ball at me. And just as against Stieg, I got down, ready to return this serve. Professor Williams pressed play, and the ball went up into the air. And just at the moment the racket head made contact with the ball, Professor Williams pressed pause. And he said, I already know why you are unable to return Stieg's serve. I said, go on then. And he said, the eye tracking monitor revealed that you were looking in the wrong place. He said, you were looking at the ball as it left the hand, went up into the air, and came down onto the racket head, which in all honesty I thought was a logical play. <laughs> <laughs> top tennis players are not looking at the ball. They're looking at the upper body of the opponent, what's sometimes called the postural orientation, how the hips relate to the waist, the shoulders, and the lower part of the arm. And depending on that pattern, they make an inference or an anticipation about where the ball is going to go hundred milliseconds before it's been struck. And the motion sensors are picking expert tennis players moving into the future part of the ball early. So I asked Professor Williams to replay the tape. And I looked at the postural orientation. But of course it didn't help me because there are innumerable 
different postural orientations, subtly different ways that the various relevant parts of the body relate to each other, that provide usable information about the future part of the ball, but which were completely opaque to me. So it raises the question, what is it about Djokovic and Andy Murray and Williams that enable them to look at a complex visual environment and make an efficient decision on how to react? You won't be surprised to hear, given the build-up, that it has nothing to do with innate reactions at all. If you test top tennis players on a neutral test of reactions, a red light goes on and you have to press a button as fast as possible, they're no faster on average than the average person in this room. It's not to do with superior vision or eyesight. What it's to do with, in my submission to you today, is years of high-quality, self-motivated practice where expert tennis players slowly and incrementally build up a conceptual cognitive repertoire that enables them to make sense of complexity. In conceptual terms, it's almost indistinguishable from a great doctor or radiologist looking at an x-ray or radiogram of complex pattern and seeing structure and meaning that is invisible to the rest of us. It's not because they have better eyesight, it's because of years of diagnostic training. And the more efficient the training, the better the judgment. Or a firefighter who can walk into a, look into a burning building and instantly discern how to deploy his or her men or women where we would be looking at the color and height of the flame. Or a prop trader in an investment bank looking at an array of computer screens and making more efficient decisions in the narrative <coughs> about the construction of a portfolio. In fact, any area of complexity is characterized by the ability to compress complexity in a way that informs expert decision making. This is not something that is, in, that is innate. I'd love to go through the examples of grandmasters in chess and all the others, but there probably isn't time. What I'd like to move on to, if I may, is the thing that I alluded to right at the start, which is, you know, it's a, it's a moderately theoretical debate. How important is talent on the one hand and high quality self-motivated practice on the other in the construction of expert performance? You know, I'm arguing that it's predominantly about the latter rather than the former, but you know, there may be people in the room who think well, it's more about the former than the latter. But what's the practical relevance of this apportioning process? Well, I want to say in this part of the presentation that the practical implications are profound and measurable. In fact, you can give any group of people a simple questionnaire to probe their beliefs at a conscious and subliminal level about where they think world-class performance comes from. And broadly speaking, you get two kinds of answers to this question. You have those over here, and I think this is a dominant view in Western culture, who say, to be really good at something, my job, a sport, a musical instrument, you need to have a gift, you need talent. And it's no good getting away from that. Over here, you get a different answer to this question, where people say that success is predominantly about effort, <coughs> application, perseverance, learning. People over here say things like, you get out what you put in, and so on. <coughs> now, these beliefs, we don't have them running in the conscious mind, minute by minute, day by day. But what's interesting is the subliminal beliefs that can be elicited by this question, and nevertheless, predicts what will happen. Because you can see where people sit on this spectrum with this simple questionnaire, go and measure behavior. And the behaviors are significantly and fundamentally different. I'll just talk through the evidence anecdotally. Suppose I'm over here, as so many people are, and they're thinking, you know what, success is about talent. Moreover, let's say that I think I've got rather a lot of talent. You may know young people who think precisely in this way about success. Success is about a gift, and I've got a gift. <coughs> In most psychological circumstances, why would I bother to work hard? Am I not just gonna drift to the top, buoyed up on my innate brilliance? This, I would argue, is a archetypal problem in Premier League football academies. I've spoken at most of them. And you have young people who have worked hard to get into the academy. Once they are there, they're surrounded by agents telling them how wonderful they are and they're getting big bank transfers into their account, and they draw a conclusion. I've got what it takes to be a great footballer. I must do, look at all this fuss around me. I don't need to work hard. And by implication, they don't make the transition into first team football. 
the coaches to a man, and it is a man in the Premier League football club, but I think that's all he wants, blame a lack of hunger or desire or drive, something of that kind. The point that I'm making today is that I think that they're barking up the wrong tree. This is a manifestation of an empirical belief. The belief that to be a great footballer, you need talent. And if you've got loads of talent, you don't need to work hard. And it's measurably self-destructive. What's worse than this mindset is people become embarrassed about the hard work. If I'm having to practice really hard to get this free kick right, that must mean I lack talent. I don't want anybody to know about it. Young people in this mindset and older people worship effortless performance. Being able to do something without even trying, that demonstrates how super talented I am. But if an individual or a culture becomes, even in a subtle way, embarrassed about the very process through which potential is materialized, think how damaging that's going to be to that culture. Let me flip it and suppose I'm over here and I think that success is about talent, but instead of thinking I've got loads of talent, I feel that I don't have very much talent at all. This, I think, is a very significant problem in British state schools. When you hear young people saying things of this kind, I don't have a brain for numbers. I'm not the kind of person who can learn a second language. I don't have the reaction speed for table tennis. I don't have a big enough memory for chess. I don't have the hand-foot coordination for, for football. These assertions don't emerge from a vacuum. Once again, they're manifestations of a worldview dominated by talent. If I don't have the right kind of brain, I can't do mathematics. If I haven't been imbued with the right mental equipment, well, then what's the point of persevering with maths lessons? What's the point of doing the maths homework? In other words, as soon as you place students in this part of the spectrum, it destroys the resilience. It is absolutely psychologically necessary to fulfill their potential. It's damage, damaging measurably and subtly, and that's why it's such a tragedy in educational terms. I'm gonna, good news is, I'm gonna contrast this mindset with the one over there, but as I do so, let me just make a couple of quick observations about the gray. I think it does go rather deep in, um, in our culture, the idea that certain people have the right kind of brain for this and other people have the wrong kind of brain for it. And given that we can't change our brains very much, well, that's a problem. The evidence suggests, and this is really at the cornerstone of the neurological explanation for the significance of practice, is that the brain is a highly adaptable organ. It's what neuroscientists say is characterized by great plasticity. Uh, one intuitive example from the literature, but there are dozens, is London black cab drivers. The area of the brain involved in spatial navigation, the hippocampus, is mu much bigger than the rest of us. But the key thing is they weren't born with it. It grew in direct proportion to years on the job. For virtuoso pianists, the area of the brain involved in finger movement is far bigger than for the rest of us. Again, it grew in direct proportion to years of high quality practice. So to use a slightly simplistic metaphor, the onboard computer that we use to make sense of phenomena in a given domain, its efficiency is at least partly a function of the processes that we put it through. And that's why the power of practice is so fundamental to where we get to in life. It's probably worth saying here that, of course, there's a, you know, there's a bell shaped distribution of skill on any given domain at the beginning of any journey, but these are not very predictive of where we get to. That Gauss, for the scientists here, that Gaussian distribution is not telling us where people will get to, because if we stick at something over a long period of time, the brain itself changes, fundamentally. Let me just go on to this mindset over here that I mentioned a bit earlier, before getting sidetracked. Well, in the moment that one moves from here to here, hypothetically, the way one thinks about one's job one's colleagues, and to a large extent one's world, is radically transformed. Suppose I fail at something. Over here, failure is a bit of a disaster. That's pretty good evidence that I'm not very good at something. Better go and try something else. Over here, failure is, by definition, an opportunity to adapt and grow. Because I believe in the capacity of my brain to change over time to get to where I want to go to. In other words, I have some control over the narrative of my own development. The way I respond to challenges is significantly different. <coughs> Interestingly, people over here are far more open about their weaknesses. 
because they recognize that by getting feedback from a colleague, a boss, the internet, or whatever, they can overcome the weakness. Over here, people are often paranoid about admitting to weaknesses because that must show that I lack talent. People are going to think I'm stupid, and so on. For those who are in a position of management, mindset, as it's called, manifests itself in two different ways. One, if I'm in control of the narrative of my own development, then of course that's going to make me more resilient and more motivated. But of course it makes me feel that way about my colleagues too. Much more likely to want to give them meaningful feedback that helps them to learn, so I recognize their grow ability. Over here, somebody's screwing up, well they're just stupid, what's the point of bothering with them? In cultural terms, I think this explains, as I talk about in advance, some of the major differences in institutional successes um, in the world today. <coughs> Love to talk more about this, but let me just um, anticipate, because I know we're going into a panel discussion after this, so there may be some questions. But did I mention a bit earlier that I, that I was British Heritage Number One? When, when I became British Number One for the first time, uh, the more than half of the top players in the country at that time didn't just come from the same town as me or the same suburb, but from the same street. Silverdale Road in Reading. And it's a very, for those who are anywhere near Reading, it's a rather anonymous street. But I knew enough about population genetics as a teenager to realize that there hadn't been a genetic mutation that had hit Silverdale Road and sort of eluded me. So we didn't share the same genes, unless my father was doing something. <laughs> the explanation for this success was about the things I've been talking about today, environment, culture, and mindset. We had the best coach in the country who taught at the school adjacent to Silverdale Road. He gave us access to high quality learning experiences. But perhaps the most important thing of all is all of us on the street had, had access to the only 24 hour a day table tennis club in the whole of the south of England. So you know most table tennis clubs, you know, the table tennis finishes, the tables go down, then badminton comes on. <coughs> in this club, the tables were always up. And everybody on Silverdale Road had a set of keys. So we could go before school, after school, holidays, weekends. Over a long period of time, this perfectly ordinary group of young people became extraordinary. Did we all reach exactly the same level? No, we didn't. My brother was a national champion, but Andy Wilder was ranked eight in England. His next door neighbor, Paul Beck, was ranked 10. Keith Hobble was 14 on the women's side. Uh, Karen Wood was a national champion in the opposite part in New Zealand. <laughs> And so on. So there were individual differences. Can genetic differences or genetic variation explain some of those individual differences? Yeah, I think it probably can. I'm not saying today that talent is completely irrelevant. But think about the success of that population, that cohort of young people. That was not about genetics. Think about other geographical concentrations of success in the world. In the 1970s, Brazil dominated football. What did the English football coaches say about that? They've got this amazing talent, the mystical, it's in the blood, the calypso magic. You know, our kids could never do that, we've got different cheek. In other words, we've never bothered to try and unlock what was really happening to drive the success of Brazil. We assumed this was just an innate mystical difference. And so we didn't coach our young people the technical skill that is so important in world class football. We continued playing on huge pitches hoofing the ball up to a front man. This idea of talent has bedeviled English football for 40 years, and still to a certain extent does. <coughs> Who dominates the world of football today? Spain, one of the last three major competitions. Barcelona, until they lost by the one time to the Bayern Munich and last season of Champions League. Nothing to do with Catalonia evolving more efficient football playing genes. It's great youth coaches finding more efficient ways to accelerate skill acquisition. The quality of practice has given Barcelona players access to rich learning experiences, which has elevated them above the rest of the world. You know, evolutionary change happens over many thousands of years, and yet look at how little pockets suddenly become world class. We've dominated cycling today. It's not because we've suddenly become brilliant, genetically speaking, great cyclists, it's because of a great coach. The great leader, David Bradford, has found ways of high quality practice through the notion of marginal gains 
to get our population above everyone else in the world. And it's probably, I've got five minutes left, haven't I? But just finishing that thought, if I may. So even though I'm accepting, I think it's important to make this point, that genetic differences do to a large extent explain some proportion of individual differences in performance. The success of populations is about a much richer picture where genetic differences are just one tiny ingredient along with culture, environment, mindset, high quality learning, self-motivation, passion, all the things we're going to learn about today. These are the things that are neglected in Western culture because we're so obsessed with talent. And that has implications for our behavior through the mindset over here, which means that individuals and institutions <coughs> measurably won't reach their potential. I'm going to make two quick observations about high quality learning and then hand back over it. I'm quite interested, I feel very excited about this because I, I really do think that it's about leaders finding ways in sports and in companies to make the learning experience at work or in practice as efficient as possible. So that with every day, every week at work, one is building skills, building knowledge in the most effective way possible. That to me I think is where the psychology of expert performance is gonna be for the next half century. And I think there are two things, and I'll quickly get these out, that are very important in terms of making experience and practice high quality. One of them is being stretched. Being stretched. And I'm going to highlight this as a sporting measure, <coughs> inevitably. World-class figure skaters fall over more often in practice than low-level figure skaters. That sounds really paradoxical. Why are the really good ones falling over more often in practice than the not so good ones? And the reason is because the really good ones are attempting jumps that are stretching their limitations, that are at the outside of their realm of reliable performance, so they go down. What happens when they've mastered the jump that they were previously falling down? They try another one, stretching them again. It's a very efficient way to learn, not just in sport, but in cerebral areas of development too. The low-level figure skaters are always attempting jumps they can already do very easily, that's why they don't fall over, but it's also why they're not world class. <coughs> the other principle that seems to be true of high quality learning in any domain is the significance of feedback. This is a remarkably subtle notion, even in the scientific community. And let me again explain what I mean with another sporting metaphor. Forgive me for all of these that you understand as a sportsman. Suppose, suppose I'm playing golf and I hit the ball, and I want it to go down the center of the fairway. And say it goes way off to the right, so I've sliced it. That's feedback. That's feedback. I know something went wrong with my swing. I need to tweak it in order to get it down the middle. Now imagine that I play golf in the dark. So I hit the ball, so there's a bit of light over the ball, and I hit the ball and it goes off into outer darkness. So I don't know where it ended up. Think about that for a moment. Because I could practice in a motivated way for 10 years or 10,000 years, without improving at all. I have no data to recalibrate what I was doing in order to improve the outcome. <coughs> now in sport, this sounds odd because feedback is instant and objective. If I hit a bad forehand, I immediately know about it. That's not true often of businesses. And I've met people who have said to me after a presentation, it feels like I've been playing golf in the dark for the last 30 years. But I haven't had access to the feedback that is a prerequisite for any improvement whatsoever to take place. Because there are lots of different departments that are going into the overall objective of the company, the feedback is delayed, it's not terribly clear about the activity, what I've been doing, what it's... it's now, think of the difference between a professional and an amateur golfer. They both go off to the right, the amateur and pro both know this, but the professional knows exactly how far to the right. They've measured it out, they've got a yardage card, they've got a caddy. So more efficient, fine-grained, granular feedback. They're also more focused on stance, alignment, and grip. So they know which aspect of a complex movement was implicated in the mistake, and therefore which bit to tweak. In a business context, for a given outcome, there are a whole array of causal mechanisms that went into that particular outcome. If it was a bad outcome, 99% of the causal mechanisms might have been brilliant. 
and maybe can only one percent of them that will let the process go down. But if you treat everything, that's an inefficient way to go about it. Deconstructing the causal mechanisms to identify what was going right and wrong is a remarkably powerful predictor of effective learning over time. And there are lots of studies that have been done in highly complex business environments to drill down into this notion. Um, I'll finish with this. I'll keep saying that. Maybe you're thinking, why doesn't he finish? Come on, hand back over the cake. No, I want to say this one last thing, uh, which is that the professional player will also videotape the performance. So they can go and watch it afterwards. Another layer of feedback. They will have a coach looking from the outside in, another layer of feedback. They'll test the counterfactual, terribly important notion, another layer of feedback, because they play more than one ball to give a mind. So an hour of practice for a professional is vastly richer and more educational than an hour of practice for an amateur. And um, so, feedback, making it work, making it efficient, institutionalizing it into the work environment. All of these things, I think, are, are very